Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the Doctrines of the Ur Church playlist and is entitled, Is Once Saved, Always Saved, Biblical? Addendum number one. So I wanted to go over some other points uh, supplemental to the initial video. Please check it out. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter one, verses three through seven here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Continuing verses 8 through 14. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now we're going to focus on verses 13 to 14, but first off regarding predestination. Lord God predestinated those who would see and believe upon the Son, right, who would accept him as their Lord and their God, who would get baptized, received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance, which we're going to get into. That's who's predestinated for these great things, for adoption as sons of God. So, God didn't choose who would become sons and choose who would not. He, God chose that if you yourself chose to become a son of God, this would be your destiny. Let's again look at verses 13 to 14 because this is the point of the video. In whom ye also trusted, right? We trusted in Christ. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So we heard the gospel. We trusted in Christ, in whom also after that ye believed. So after we believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we got baptized and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So all of these are physically alive on earth and they've been promised eternal life in the future. So the word is earnest. Now, again, this is one of the examples when the, the, the English of the King James might confuse the modern reader. What does earnest mean? Let's look at some other English translations on that particular verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. NIV, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So it's a deposit. New Living Translation, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. ESV, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the inheritance is eternal life. Brian Standard Bible, who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. New King James, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And NASB, who is a first installment of our inheritance in regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So it's the Holy Spirit that we get at the time of our baptism is a deposit, is a guarantee, is a pledge is a first installment of our future inheritance, which is eternal life. In the Greek, o estin arabon tis kleronomias imon is apolitrosin. So notice the guarantee, the earnest is arabon. That's Greek Strong's 728. And finishing off the verse, tis peri puiseos is epenon. Tis doxis aftu. So there's 
the word arabon. That particular variation is only used in this particular verse, pledge, earnest, guarantee. Again, Greek strong 728, arabon, an earnest, a part payment in advanced for security. It's a masculine noun, an earnest, a part payment in advance for security, an earnest, earnest money, a large part of the payment given in advance as a security that the whole will be paid afterwards. Uh, an installment, a deposit, it's a down payment which guarantees the balance the full purchase price. So the regular terms, the New Testament terms for earnest money, advance payment that guarantees the rest will be given, represents full security backed by the purchaser who supplies sufficient pr pr proof that they will purchase the entire pledge. The promise is common in the papyri for a down payment earnest money and hence frequent in business documents and agreements. Now here's the thing though. So it's a first installment, it's a down payment, but it's a down payment for what? A good or a service. It's not for nothing. So yes, we're given the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as a first installment, that we need to do something. It's a contract. It's a contract for goods and services, right? So it's not that we get the down payment and we don't have to do anything. That would not be a contract. Contract goes both ways, right? There's a purchaser of goods and services, and the goods and services need to be provided. So you get your first installment, you, and the guarantee is if you do those goods and services, you will get the final payment, which in this case would be eternal life. NAS Exhaustive Concordance, it's of Hebrew origin, erabon, again, earnest, a part payment in advance for security, and in the NASB, it's given as a pledge, one occurrence, pledge, two occurrences. Again, three total occurrences. Arabon, one occurrence which we saw, and Arabona, two occurrences. So let's look at those. Again, here they are. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, Arabona. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, Arabona. And what we looked at, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, Arabon. So let's look at the verses in 2 Corinthians in context. Here's verses 18 through 22. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. We have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And again, God here referring to the person God the Father, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So the same sort of uh, concept that we saw in Ephesians chapter 1, 1, verse 14. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, again in context, verses 1 through 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, right? What is that? That's our physical bodies. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. You could look at also the tabernacle being this dimension, this physical dimension, this fallen world that we live in. Uh, being burdened, not for that we sh would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God who also hath given us the earnest, the down payment of the Spirit. So notice the Holy Spirit is the down payment that we receive at our baptism. And we need to believe upon the Lord, as, the Lord Jesus Christ as our Son and our God, or excuse me, as our Lord and our God, forgive me, the Divine Son who took on flesh as our Lord and our God, right, fulfilling the will of the Father. We get baptized, we receive the earnest, we receive the down payment, we receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit and there is a contract here, and we will receive eternal life, right, later, but that doesn't mean we don't have to fulfill our part of the bargain, does it? Okay, here's the Hebrew. Hebrew Strong's 61, 61, 62, forgive me, Erebon, masculine noun, a pledge. From Arab, in the sense of exchange, upon giving a security pledge. Uh, it's three occurrences in the Old Testament. Erebon, one occurrence and ha erabon, two occurrences. Here they are. Again, you'll notice they're all in Genesis chapter 38, verse 17, verse 18, and verse 20. So let's look at that, starting in verse 12 to put all this in context. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's 
wife died. So Judah, right, the fourth son of Israel, his wife died, and Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shares to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Aldomite. And it was told Tamar, remember, Tamar was the wife of, of one of Judah's sons, right, who had sinned, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. So Tamar knows that Judah is going up to this area. Verses 14 through 19. And she, Tamar, put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, for she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. So Shelah was one of the sons of Judah, and Judah did not give Tamar to Shelah. Uh, when Judah saw her, remember she's covered, he doesn't recognize her, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in to thee. Oh boy. For he knew not that she was his daughter in law. <laughs> he thinks she's just a harlot. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in to me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge, an era born, till thou send it? So notice the there's a contract happening here. It's kind of a wicked contract, right? She's selling her body as a, what, a, what, what, what uh, Judah thinks, as a harlot. And the purchase price that's going to be paid later is a kid from the flock. But he doesn't have that right now. So he's going to give her a pledge. He's going to give her an era born. And what is it? She said, thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is thine hand. And he gave it her, came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And she, she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. So she went back to her original clothes of being a widow of one of Judah's sons. So notice what the Erebon was. It was a pledge, but notice there was a contract here. And she needed to provide a good in service. And the good in service was what? Her body for him to sleep with her, for him to lay with her, for him to come into her. Continuing verses 20 through 23. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adelite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. So now he's sending the agreed upon uh, item, which was the kid, and he's expecting to receive back his pledge, his erabon. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. Continuing verses 24 to 26. And it came to pass about three months after that was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt, not now realizing that he was the one who she played the harlot with, right? When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff, the Erebon. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shalah, my son. And he knew her again no more. Right? So he, basically, he had promised her to his son Shalah and did not give her to Shalah. So that's why he realized, you know, she was wicked, but I was even more wicked, because we both did fornication, right? We both did you know, some form of adultery here, right? Um, so we were both wicked in terms of that. And I was more wicked than her because not only did I, I do that uh, sin, which she did, but I basically didn't fulfill my pledge to her. Uh, you know, not the Erebon, but a promise to give her to Shalah. So notice again, Erebon in context, right? New Testament, Old Testament. And again, I'm not going to go into all the historical information, but again, an Erebon was not just given and for nothing. There was always for a good or for a service. So again, in terms of that verse, which is used by certain individuals as, as a support for once saved, always saved. Again, we need to do something. We need to not just believe. We need to have faith, and faith will have works. We need to hold on to that gift of the Holy Spirit, right? We need to be Israel, to struggle with God, against the sin in this world and against the sin within our own flesh. We need to love Lord Jesus Christ, which means loving his commandments, right? Which means we are not going to willfully sin. We are not going to think, oh, we're already saved. We can do anything we want, 
right? So basically, we got the Edabon. We're going to get, so we're, we're going to, you know, we got, let's look at um, uh, Tamar and Judah as an example here that we finished off with, right? So, you know, Judah gave us his, uh, you know, bracelets and his ring and his staff. Um, he promised us a kid. We don't have to do anything. Not true, right? So the Edabon is a down payment for a future payment, right? The whole amount, in this case, what we're talking about from a New Testament perspective is eternal life. But we need to provide a good or service to God, right? Which is struggling with him, being his Israel, right? We were his Jacob. We grabbed our older brother by the heel, right? Our older brother who was red and hairy, like Esau Edom was red and hairy, right? The bloody lamb. We grab our older brother by the heel. We're Jacob. We grab our older brother by the heel. He takes us out of the darkness. Remember, there were twins in the womb. He's our older brother, right? Through and, and, and births us through the waters of baptism, takes us out into the light, right? Now we have the light, right? We have the gospel of Christ. We know the truth, right? But then we become Israel, right? We need to struggle with God against ourselves and against this wicked world. We need to spread the gospel. We need to do good works for fellow brothers and sisters in Lord Jesus as we're ordered to do so, right? And then that's the goods and services we need to do. We got the Arabone, we do the goods and services, and then we are promised eternal life. That, that inheritance will be given to us. But if we do nothing, right? If we do nothing, if we don't provide the goods and services, we're not going to receive eternal life. And God didn't uh, break the deal. We broke the deal. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 18. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, right? This is the Lord Jesus, right? Traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, right? He's giving his servants and we're his servants his goods. What's his goods? What did he have? He had the Holy Spirit. What does he give to us? The Holy Spirit. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. See, all of us have been given talents, right? Some more than others, some more spiritual gifts than others, right? Each according to his own ability. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Notice, he did something with the Holy Spirit, right? He made more, he spread the gospel or whatever, whatever you want to um, use in this illustration for making five more talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. And he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. He buries it in the earth, right? Remember, we die with Lord Jesus in baptism and are resurrected. Notice, he's burying, he's burying it like Lord Jesus was buried. Lord Jesus is resurrected and did nothing with the gifts. Continuing, verses 19 to 21. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. So notice this, after a long time. So notice Lord Jesus in these parables, what's he saying? I'm going to come back a long time from now. So any fool who says, oh, the early church believed that Lord Jesus would come at any day. Really? I don't think so. <laughs> think of what uh, St. Paul said in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that that day, the coming of Lord Jesus in the clouds, will not come till a great apostasy, till the church falls into total apostasy and the man of sin is declared. So obviously this was going to be very, very far into the future. I'm not going to go into that, but that is obviously true. Continuing. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents saying, Lord, right, Lord Jesus, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more, right? You gave me spiritual gifts. You gave me the Holy Spirit. I did stuff with it that matters to you spiritually. That's why he, he, he had talents, and he makes talents. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. By the way, you'll see this is happening at the you know, judgment of the sheep and the goats, right? You're going to be raised at that last day into eternal life, and you did good things on earth with the talents you were given, with the Holy Spirit you were given. You're going to have rewards in the new creation. Verses 22 to 23. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So he didn't have as many spiritual gifts as the first individual, but doubled them just like the first individual did and <laughs> receives reward. 
verses 24 to 25. Then he, which had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hired man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. So notice, we all know that who does the reaping, who does the gathering? Lord Jesus. But Lord Jesus wants us to work with him, not to just say, you, you, you do all the work, Lord Jesus. I'm not going to do nothing. And I was afraid we're not supposed to have fear, right? If we have the Holy Spirit, we don't have a spirit of fear. We have a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. And when hid thy talent in the earth, we're supposed to have our light shining for the world, not hide it in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. Oh, here's that Holy Spirit back. Verses 26 to 28, his Lord answered and said unto him, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers and then am I coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath 10 talents. Verses 29 to 30, for unto everyone that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Right? And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. That's the final hell. That's Gehenna. So this servant was a believer but did nothing with the gift of the Holy Spirit and is thrown into Gehenna. So this was not really a sheep. This was a goat because he did no work with the Holy Spirit he was given. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what Lord Jesus teaches. That surely completely proves once saved, always saved, is false. Remember, no one can take you out of the hand of God, right? No one can. No man can do it, but you can jump out of that hand, right? God will not let go of you, but you can let go of God. God is a God of free will. Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 17. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, right? Oh, it's, the end's going to happen right now. No, far into the future. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. A guy obviously referring to himself. And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. It came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Verses 18 through 27. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which hath kept laid up in a napkin. Interesting. Notice, buried in the earth, right? Lord Jesus was buried in the earth, right? But was resurrected, right? And bound, uh, laid up in a napkin. If you look at the account of John, right? When uh, uh, St. Peter and St. John found the tomb that was open, what did they see? They saw, right, the, um, uh, the, the burial clothes and the face cloth is described as folded up like a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up, that thou layest not down, and reapest, that thou did not sow. And he saith to them, Out of thy own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that it was an austere man, taking up, that I laid not down, and reaping, that I did not sow. Wherefore, then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that on my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Again, this is referring to final judgment. And who were those enemies, right? Well, those enemies, right, didn't want him to rule over them. You know, were these those Jews who uh, called for his crucifixion? Yes, and also, also all the other people of the world at that time, between that time, this time, who hate Lord Jesus, who don't love him, who he's not their friend, right? He's their enemy. And again, this is you know, focusing uh, on the future, uh, final judgment, judgment of the sheep and the goats, a great white throne judgment. And remember, at that time, the goats are thrown into Gehenna. That's probably what that's referencing spiritually. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, Lord Jesus Christ, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So that's how they're going to be slain. They're going to be slain by being thrown 
body and soul into Gehenna, right? The lake of fire and brimstone, the final hell, outer darkness. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we, notice this is Ephesians, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we're predestinated, right? That this is what we're supposed to do. Those of us who truly love Lord Jesus, who truly want to be adopted in the family, who truly want to later marry into the family, this is what we do, all right? We do good works, we get the talents, we get the pounds, and we do something with these things spiritually while on this earth, this physical dimension, you know, according to our own ability. Now, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 through 40, again, referencing the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, right, the sheep, come ye blessed of my father, and here the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, predestinated, right? But we have to choose to be the sheep and stay the sheep, right? So God didn't choose who's going to be the sheep and who's going to be the goats, but God chose the path we need to follow, and if we do, we get this inheritance. For I was in hunger and gave me meat. I was thirsty and gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we see thee, excuse me, uh, the sick or in prison and came unto thee. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it, a work unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So notice, these are sheep, right? These have always called him Lord, right? These state that they love him. These state that they have faith in him. These state that they want to be adopted in the family, married in the family. But they needed to do at least once something for one of his brethren. Who are his brethren? Luke chapter 8, verse 21. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Ah, to be a brother or sister or mother of Lord Jesus, right? We need to hear the word of God and do it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, which everyone will, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, right? That's why these servants were thrown into Gehenna. Because, yeah, they said, Lord, Lord, but that was just with their mouth. Their heart was far from him. Heart was far from him, right? They didn't do the will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? Uh, chapter 12, verse 50, before we get to that, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Notice these spiritual points being brought over, over in different ways beautifully. And then, John 6, 40, and this is the will of him that sent me, the will of the Father, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. But guess what? We need to also hear the word of God and do it, not just see and believe upon the Son, right? We get the Erebon, but we have to fill our end of the contract. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15, to finish up, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and other buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no mind lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, right? These are those spiritual talents that mean something. Wood, hay, and stubble, well, you'll see these don't mean as much. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, that final day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So there's better works than others. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Set, yet so is by fire. Notice something. It's because he did work. He did do some good works. They just weren't of that much value. Right? So obviously, the gold, silver, and precious stones would be a, a, a true believer with so much faith, 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 being a saint in this life, not just in the next, who spread the gospel message fervently, loved Lord Jesus, followed his commandments, right? He heard the word of God, did the word of God, you know, um, helped the brothers and sisters and mother of Lord Jesus in the world with good works, etc. Whereas someone who did wood, hand, stubble, you know, did some works, but they really weren't that impressive, but they did do some works, <laughs> right? Because if you notice, at least um, based upon what we saw in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, we looked at the verses pertaining to the sheep. Looks like at least if you just did it one time, one time is all you needed to do. So it's not much work, right? But you need, do need to do something beyond just seeing and believing upon the Son, getting baptized, and saying 
right? With your mouth, but not with the actions of your heart, right? That, that he is your Lord. Remember, everyone will eventually call him Lord. Everyone will eventually um, bend the knee. So there's more to it than just calling him Lord. So I pray that was edifying and further supported the initial video that obviously once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. And that's why it wasn't taught by the early church. And that's why it's found in none of the current branches of that um, uh, early universal um, uh, church, right? It's not found in the Roman Catholic branch. It's not found in the Eastern Orthodox branches. It's not found in the Coptic Orthodox. And it's not found in the Assyrian Church of the East. So again, I pray that was edifying. Amen.